So this is a topic that I just came across maybe three months ago. And well, I discovered that there was something I might be able to contribute to this specific topic. Uh, ridge functions being essentially functions of W transpose X, where W is a weight vector and X is our input. Uh, this is work that I've been doing with Pelle Jorgensen, who is an analyst at the University of Iowa. And so I'll start with something controversial. Uh, you may or may not have heard of extreme learning machines. This is something, this is relatively recent. They are simply neural networks where you just generate the weights on the side before the activation functions and just train on the weights on the other side. The nice thing about this is that it results in a least squares problem. That's all your optimization, that's all your training is, apart from generating the weights before the activation function. So, as standard architecture, we have uh, our inputs, our hidden nodes, which have a weighted sum of the arrow, things along, going along the arrows, and we have an activation function there, typically hyperbolic tangent or some other sigmoidal function. And then we have the weights to the outputs, and it's just training on these weights, leaving these alone. Now, these were, I don't know, invented, created, marketed, <laughs> named by this guy G.B. Huang in uh, uh, National Technical University in Singapore. And he claimed the name Extreme Learning Machines, which created a lot of controversy because people said there's nothing new here. But they have nevertheless been applied to a range of machine learning tasks and found to be reasonably successful. I'm not going to claim any special properties for them, except that they are very, very fast to train, because all you're doing is solving a least squares problem. But when you do this, it means that you can think of the, there is a, okay, so we have George Chebenko's paper from 1989 which showed a universal approximation properties for regular neural networks where your input weight vectors could be anything you optimize over them and presumably get the optimal. Now for extreme learning machines you just generate the W's on the side before the activation functions. And so this leads to a, an, excuse me, an intermediate approximation problem, which is approximation by ridge functions. That is, or in particular, spans of ridge functions where the W's appear to be over a specific set, the ones you generated in an extreme learning machine. Now, the question is, the first question is, over what sets W is the, this V sub W, this, the span of the ridge functions, dense in the space of continuous functions? Second, if it's not dense, then how good are the approximations going to be? And there's an important point here that we have to pick nice functions in here uh, because otherwise the functional analysis tells us that there are things that we really can't approximate. Okay, so general framework. Barnack space, X. That's the space everything lives in. So for us it's going to be the space of continuous functions with the supremum norm and uh, in fact continuous functions over j to the m, which is simply the hypercube. Um, it's, a, I would, it, more or less a u standard hypercube from, based on the interval negative one to one rather than zero to one. Now, the approximating functions live in the subspace V, and density means the closure of V is X. 
Okay, if the closure V is not X, then you can show with a little bit of functional analysis that for any epsilon there are functions non-zero where no matter what function you pick from the approximating space V, you can't get closer than 1 minus epsilon times the norm of F. Okay, which means you've got these two cases, either V is dense or V is not dense, which means you've got a 0, 1 answer, which doesn't give you a very good idea about how well you're really approximating <laughs> functions unless your subspace is dense. So, what we need to do is to pick something in between a vector space Z compactly embedded in X and then we have something for which we can get a reasonable answer. Okay, in our case, our overall space is set of continuous functions on a standard hypercube. V is going to be a span of the ridge functions generated by these weight function, weight vectors. And I'm going to take Z to be the space of Lipschitz functions and use the Lipschitz norm. This is actually a semi-norm, but uh, no matter what space of ridge functions you use, you're going to include constants. If you have a constant function there, so you can essentially subtract out constants. So for example, you can assume that the function value at zero is zero. For example, you could use some other normalization, but whatever normalization you're doing, you're essentially quotienting out the constant functions, which means that the, in that case, the Lipschitz semi-norm becomes a real norm. Okay, now, there are still going to be things you can't approximate in the sense that the norm in the big space is not reduced by trying to approximate it by any non-zero thing out of our approximating subspace. Now, for example, if we can find a closest point to a closest point in our subspace, call it H, to our original function F, then F minus H is an unapproximable function because you can't do any better than that. Right. Now, existence of closest points is guaranteed if our big space is a reflexive space or if the subspace is finite dimensional. But in our case, Ridge functions are not a finite dimensional subspace, they're infinite dimensional. So we don't necessarily have a guarantee that there is a closest point. Now, so this means I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be very good at getting upper bounds for the worst case, but I can certainly get lower bounds. And I'm particularly interested in what happens when dealing with fairly high dimensional problems where the dimension of the input vector is, or the m that I've, um, from the previous slide, uh, the m is fairly large. So, the main tool here is the separating hyperplane theorem. If you've got a closed and convex set, and you've got a point not in the set, then there is a separating hyperplane that Separ strictly separates from one from the other. Now the, the mu, the, the vector that gives you the almost uh, the normal for the separating hyperplane is going to be in the dual space. And the dual space, the space of continuous functions on a hypercube is a set of Borel measures on that same hypercube. Now, this work started out from a reading of George Chebenko's paper from 1989. And he was able to show that uh, for a sigmoidal function, it doesn't have to be a hyperbolic tangent. There's a lot of things it'll do so long as they have finite limits. Uh, as u goes to negative infinity and plus infinity, they're different. You can show that the span of all those ridge functions 
over all weight functions is indeed going to give you the entirety of the space of continuous functions over the hypercube. Now the dual space that I've noticed there, noted there is the space of Borel measures, well, of bounded variation. Uh, they can be signed Borel measures, they, they're not necessarily positive. Okay, and the duality pairing is simply the integral with respect to the measure. Now, the way George Chibenko's proof works, and this is putting in a slightly different form from what he does, but this is essentially the result that the, uh, it's what's called the marginal measure, defined like this, is going to be zero for every W in the set of weight vectors. But the thing that makes it amenable to some real treatment is the Fourier transform. Now we can take a measure on the unit hypercube and extend it by zero to the rest of Rm and then take the Fourier transform. And this is going to be a finite valued thing because the Borel measure is, has finite variation. And what we also get is that it's not just finite valued, it's also because its support is on a compact set, it's also analytic everywhere in the sense of complex analysis or multivariate Taylor series. So you take a Taylor series at the origin, that's going to converge everywhere. That's nice. Okay. And the other thing is often described as being of exponential type. That is, the if you start putting in complex uh, psi vectors in our Fourier transform, then the size is only going to grow exponentially in the size of the imaginary part. Okay. Now. Our result for the marginal measure in terms of the Fourier transform is very simple. That, okay, what we get is that the Fourier transform evaluated at any multiple, real multiple of one of these W vectors has to be exactly zero. And because of that, if W can be any vector, at all in RM, then the only mu you can get is going to be zero. Zero everywhere? Oh, that means that our uh, assumptions for the separating hyperplane theorem have to be false. Because you can't put in a mu and get a non-zero for the outside point. So therefore there's no outside point, therefore the space of uh, spans of the ridge functions over all w's is dense in the space of continuous functions. Right. So therefore we have the universal approximation property of standard neural networks. Okay, but what if we have a fixed set of w's? Right. Now, we can get lower bounds from this approach if we construct, we're, what we're going to do is actually construct a measure and f use a function associated with that measure and use that to show that that function cannot be approximated is essentially unapproximable by the ridge functions using these weight vectors. Right. So this measure has to have satisfy the property that its Fourier transform is zero along the rays or lines generated by the W's W vectors in our set. Now, first thing I should point out, it's been known for a while that this, subs this approximating subspace of ridge functions is not going to be dense if our set of weight vectors is finite. Doesn't matter what you pick, you're not going to fill up all continuous functions this way. Right. Furthermore, they're able to show something since our Fourier transform is analytic. We can take the first, the smallest degree homogeneous polynomial, uh, the leading term, if you like, of the Fourier transform, 
And you just have to look at that. If there is a homogeneous polynomial that is non-zero at uh, and all these rays, then VW is not dense in the space of continuous functions. Right. So if you've got a finite W, which is what we have, then what can we do? How bad can it be? I would argue it can be fairly bad. So here's a very simple case. Two-dimensional E1, E2. That's it. So what we need is a measure with Fourier transform that is zero along those two axes, along the coordinate axes. And if we have uh, delta sub V is the delta function, unit mass, unit measure at V, then, well, we can think, okay, let's find a uh, nice polynomial that's going to be zero along those coordinate axes. Xi1, Xi2, right? Zero along the axes. Okay. Now, I want to create a measure, but it's uh, Xi1, Xi2 is not the Fourier transform of a finite variation Borel measure on the unit hypercube. But I can do this modification. This is essentially negative i times sine Xi1, negative i times sine Xi2. And we find we get uh, it's still going to be real, the measure is going to be real valued. And what we get is mu is the sum of delta functions with uh, plus or minus one. I've got the picture. Okay. So on a, the square, on the corners of a, um, corners of a unit square, we can make it plus one top right, plus one bottom left, and the other two corners are negative one. And they are the weights of the delta function. And that's, um, that's the measure. We want to have a function that is positive at top right, bottom left, but negative at bottom right, top left. What function is that? x1, x2. Okay. So this function is unapproximable by ridge functions of x, function of x1 plus the function of x2. You can't approximate this any better than with a zero. So, the strategy, find the mu, now look at the Fourier transform, fix the Fourier transform, this gives us the measure, that tells us what kind of function or where the function should be plus or minus one, and somehow fill in in between. And you want something that has, preferably, since we want to sort of minimize the Lipschitz constant, how small can we make the Lipschitz constant? Uh, in the case where we've got the function x1, x2 on the unit square, then you can check with the gradient in the corners that it's got Lipschitz constant root 2 is the best you can do. Uh, I want to mention there's been other people who've looked at this problem. I'm not the first. And 1991, there was a related problem thinking of the same kind of thing. Uh, Mayorov uh, used an L2 approach, which is nice because you can do Fourier transforms and work with it that way. The Z, the intermediate space, is a Sobolev, sp um, is a Sobolev space of differentiability order R. And he looked at, he didn't look at a fixed W, but he allowed W to vary, but fixed the cardinality of that set. So if you have no more than so many P weight vectors, how good can you do the approximation? And he got this result, which has a nice asymptotic result, so that as the number of vectors in W becomes larger, then the error goes to zero. Of course, you still have to find the right vectors, 
the right weight vectors in order to get this convergence, to get this rate of convergence, which involves some sort of optimality, which maybe we still don't know how to do. Also, there's a hidden constant in here, and that is the factor C of M. The, there's a hidden constant that depends on the, on the set, on the region on which you're doing this. And of course, as you change the dimension, you're changing that set. So there's implicit dependence on dimension that he doesn't explicate. 2012, there's a guy called Ismailov who he did look at finite W's, finite sets of weight vectors, fixed weight vectors, and he had this really complicated condition for seeing if you could, were able to interpolate. Now, the trouble is, he, what was puzzling to me is that he was not able to show that if the weight, uh, if the set of weight vectors is finite, then it's not a dense subspace. But it involves this condition, which is rather hard to verify. Right. So, what I'm going to try to do, uh, the rest of my talk is going to be how we can get some, hopefully you'll see as non-trivial, as worthwhile lower bounds for how bad the approximations can be. So, we want to construct a measure, we want to split it into the, use a Hahn or Jordan decomposition to split it into a uh, positive part and a negative part. And we want the supports, that is, um, these are going to be closed sets, but not just Borel, but closed sets, that is supports, that are going to be disjoint. And now, for example, we had uh, delta functions, uh, positive in the top right, bottom left, negative in the top left, bottom right. Supports are going to be either diagonally corners that way for the positive and diagonally opposite corners for the negative part. Obviously, they're disjoint which means they're going to have a positive separation. So I'm going to try construct a Lipschitz function that is plus one on the support of the positive part, negative one on the support of the negative part, and it turns out that we can get the optimal value for Lipschitz constant being two divided by the closest points between those two supports. And the way to do it is that formula. That formula gives us a Lipschitz function with that Lipschitz value and is plus one on A and negative one on B. And you can check that. All right. And if we scale it, we can sh show that for Lipschitz constant one, we, the function can be the maximum magnitude value of f can be no more than this value here for this function. So the next part is how do we do the geometry? How do we do the geometry so it can actually make this all work? So, right, so here's the approach. You've got a fixed set, p vectors. There could be a lot here. We need a lot more than just the dimension of the space. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out z1 perpendicular to the first m minus 1 of them. Now we're working in m dimensions. So the w1 through wm minus 1 span an m minus 1 dimension, m minus 3 uh, w vectors. And we can keep on going in this way. Now, if we guarantee, what we want to do is to put delta functions at all the points which are sums of plus or minus one times the z vectors. And you want all these to sit inside the unit hypercube. 
our standard hypercube. We can, uh, okay, we can write this thing out, the mu, the Fourier transform of the mu in terms of this product. And Q is actually M minus 1. Yeah. Or we can think of mu as being a convolution product of these delta functions. It puts the, uh, the delta functions, when you do this convolution, all in the right places. Now, to make sure that we have all these sums of plus or minus zk's inside the unit standard hypercube, we just have to make sure that the length of the zk's in the 2 norm is no more than 1 on the square root of m minus 1 because they're orthogonal to each other. That was the reason for that construction. So it turns out that with this construction we get for 1 half m times m minus 1 vectors in our set of weight vectors that we can find functions that are going to be Lipschitz with constant 1 but their uh, infinity norm is 2 divided by square root of m minus 1. This is not particularly small. And it could be worse depending on just, this is sort of the, for any fixed set of 1 half m times m minus 1 vectors, if they were, if we could get the z's more aligned with the coordinate axes, we could do better than this. So I would argue that this is not a really great scheme for approximating functions with this number of fixed weight vectors. Now you can repeat the process to go beyond 1 half m times m minus 1 weight vectors. You can start thinking about picking the z's to create a smaller hypercube that fits inside the big one, but then you've got a what? You've got extra factor of root m minus 1 at least, maybe an extra factor of a half to shrimp, make sure you've got all the distances that all the, th the first and second hypercubes are well separated from each other. Okay, so, but we can at least get this, this bound here. And it seemed to me that if you want to be able to approximate functions, any function, reasonably well with a fixed set of weight vectors, then you need at least order um, uh, m squared. Okay. So my conclusion is, first of all, for extreme learning machines, okay, we should have something like at least m squared, where m is a dimension, hidden units. Now, for regular neural networks, of course, we're supposed to optimize over those weights feeding into the activation units. It's not clear to me how effective that is. If it is ineffective, I know that we can do optimization over the weights on the other side because that's just least squares. And our stochastic gradient descent might be very good at bringing out the, reducing those, the errors due to those weights but not doing a very good job on the weights on the other side. That would seem to me, maybe, we might need, if we have, say, 10 inputs, maybe we need half 10 squared, about 50 hidden units at least. If you are having the MNIST data set, that's uh, 27 squared pixels, if you're just doing it straight on, directly with that input as the input data is not using a deep learning approach, then you'd be want roughly one half the square of 27 squared hidden units, which is getting to be rather a lot. Okay. But maybe we need, maybe we should be using more hidden units than are actually used. And finally, 
a way to get around this in part is to think about using dimension reduction rather more aggressively than maybe is common practice. So that's my conclusions and that's my talk and I think we have plenty of time. <laughs>